In chapter 10, we're going to move into a very, very large and important topic for any statistics course, namely hypothesis testing. So this is a very, very big deal, um, but you can't really jump right into hypothesis testing without laying some foundational understanding. And that's what we're going to do in section 10.1. So 10.1 is going to lay out some definitions, some assumptions we make, and some um, other important ideas for hypothesis testing. We're not actually going to do hypothesis tests, quote unquote, until section 10.2 and 10.3 and so on. But keep in mind that the definitions and the ideas and the concepts that you're learning in 10.1 are really important. They permeate the rest of this chapter. They permeate chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, 14 and 15 as well, if we were going to go on to those chapters. It's so foundational um, to understand how hypothesis testing works and operates. And this section is going to hopefully <laughs> lay that foundation for us. All right, so let's begin with an exploratory example that if you're in a face-to-face -face class, I actually have you do in class. So every student has a six-sided die, and they're going to roll it 12 times. And the idea is to count how many fives they got when they rolled that. So you're going to roll the die 12 times, count how many fives. So for example, I did it myself, and I, when I did it, I rolled, and I got two fives out of the 12. All right, and then I had a class of people do this, a classroom full of people do this, and these were the frequencies I got. So I had two students get no fives at all. So they rolled 12 times, no fives. Then I had four students, they rolled 12 times, and they only got one five. Um, two was the most common, which should not be any shock because um, the probability of getting a 12, or excuse me, getting a five is one out of six. One out of six times 12 would make two, right? So it's the binomial um, mean that we learned in section 6.2. So 10 is very, very common. I had seven students get three and so on and so on and so on. And not surprisingly, I had nobody get seven, nobody get eight because you're rolling this die 12 times. You don't expect eight fives. But I did, however, have somebody get 12 fives right there. Matter of fact, I'm going to give them an orange color. You should be beware of what is going on with this student. Oh, maybe red. Red will be even better. Warning, danger, something's going on. So this student, quote unquote, actually it wasn't a student, I believe it was my husband, who's the other stats professor, he, um, he got 12 out of 12 fives, and his name is Steve. So Steve, quote unquote, had 12 out of 12 fives. Now what are some conclusions that we jump to when we see that? And as a matter of fact, the students in the room did this. They were like, he's lying. Something's going on, right? Okay, so what are the possibilities? So it could be that he's lying, right? That would mean that we had a biased sample, right? Sample is biased. He knew what we wanted. He faked his results. He um, purposely, you know, I don't know, made it land on five every time, something like that. Okay, so that's possible, but we're going to assume in general that that's not happening. We're going to assume in general we don't have biased samples because we, if there's one thing we've learned in this course, that if your sample is biased and not random, all bets are off. I mean, you have to throw out everything. You can't do calculations off of stuff that's biased. We can, but the calculations are bogus. All right, so that's a possibility, though. It could be just a random fluke right? It happens. I mean, rare things do occur upon this many casinos are built, right? So um, it, it could just be a random chance. It could just be he just happened to get 12 fives in a row with nothing else. Right. And so in your head, hopefully you're thinking, well, I don't think so. I don't think so either, right? And that leads to us to only one other conclusion. So if he's not lying, and if it wasn't a fluke, that means that there was one other option, which is that the parameter, remember that, was the, that word, P, right, the proportion of fives, that's what capital P of five means, um, that we assumed is not one-sixth. All right. Now, if these options look familiar to you, they should. We covered them in Chapter 8, um, and they're the same options as before. So you could have a bias sample. You could have a fluke. Right. So for our purposes, bias samples don't really do much for us. I mean, they happen a lot in real life. But there's only so much you can do with a sample that's biased. Matter of fact, you can't really do much of it at all that's valid, statistically speaking. So we kind of go, yeah, we didn't have a biased sample. He's not lying. You know, I'm married to him. I don't think he would lie to me. All right. So could it be random chance? I mean, could it be a fluke? Right. Well, we'll figure that out. I mean, it's possible. 
but I'm going to give you a hint. The probability is very, very low. You have a better chance of being struck by lightning twice than this. So something's going on with that. Um, that leads us to this one, which is the most likely one, right? Which is that maybe it wasn't a sixth for him like we assumed. Maybe his die was not the proportion of fives is one six. Maybe it was something else say like 100%, which is what it was. I have rigged dice in my office that will do nothing but roll fives. I'm a nerd. I have these kind of things. Actually, you can buy them for two bucks on Amazon if you're interested. Okay, so what kind of evidence do we have for this one? Because this is the one we're going to go with. And primarily because, not because the other two don't happen. They do, but there's nothing we can do with them, right? So what what's the evidence we have that something is up with his die? So the first thing we have is that he is so far away from everybody else. When you look at this table, look at all these zeros, and there he is by himself. And I mean, I did well to have one student have six. I mean, that's pretty low probability in and of itself. But it's not so low that you think something's up with their die, right? You assume that the next time they do it, they'll get less fives, right? But Steve, with 12 fives, something's going on there. And you can spot it because he is so far away from everybody else. As a matter of fact, we can figure out how big that gap is. So because this is a binomial experiment, we learned how to find the mean for the number of fives it, back in section 6.2. It's n times p, which would be 12 times 1 sixth, which is 2, right? Which is why we have such a large number of students at 2. This was an actual classroom. My husband just happened to be in there that day, right? So. Um, it's such a huge amount there because that's your mean, right? So the mean for your number of fives is two. The standard deviation we can also figure out because we learned how to do that in section 6.2. It was the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which is the square root of 12 times a 6 times 1 minus 1 6, which if I just grab a calculator and do it, I'll get a 1.291 approximately. So real quick, let me prove a couple of things to you. One, this is binomial. There's the mean and standard deviation formulas from the binomial random variable. This, these notes are from section 6.2. So it's been a while. All right, so let me close that. And then let me prove to you that it's 1.291. So I want the square root of 12 times uh, 1 6 times 1 minus 1 6. I don't really need that time symbol in there. I don't know why I did that. I'll go get rid of it. My calculator's being weird over there. That's all right. There we go. See? 1.291. Beautiful. Okay, so why did this help me? Well, I can find Steve's z-score, in fact, right? Steve's z-score, the z-score for uh, Steve, I should capitalize his name, I suppose, <laughs> Steve, is, now remember, we learned z-scores way back in, oh my goodness, chapter three. But I also have them on my decision matrix from chapter seven. Let me bring that up right here. Right? I know the mu and the sigma and the x value of 12, so I would just use this formula right here. So it's x minus mu, so 12 take away the mu of 2 divided by 1.291, roughly. And I will find, let's see here, parentheses, 12 take away 2, close parentheses, divided by 1.291. I get about 7.75. That is huge, right? That is a very large z-score. Right? Huge z-score. Very unusually high. Huge z-score, very unusually high. Oops, I can't put my exclamation point in there. How about this? A very unusually high z-score. How about that? And then I can get my exclamation points in. I'm gonna let the p-value slip down here. So there's a huge gap, and we just proved it.
right? The huge gap comes from his z-score, right? He's so many standard deviations away from the mean. The mean is actually right here at two, right? Matter of fact, I'll give it a little um, color here so you guys can see it. So the mean is actually two, which is what we just got right here with that value, right, right here. So that mean is two, and he is so far away from the rest of it. As a matter of fact, he's 7.75 standard deviations away from the rest of it. That is crazy high. That is very unusual. So we think something's going on. We think for him, for whatever reason, his die was not a six. Something's happening here, right? Because we're assuming that he's not lying to us because he's a nice person. And it's not random chance. Well, we'll, we'll show that one in a second. But something, something fishy is happening. All right now, what about the random chance, right? It's possible, right? It's possible that he just had a really, really unusual lucky 12 out of 12 fives. But let's find the probability of that, right? So p-value stands for probability. So the probability is your p-value. So that p-value will be the probability of getting 12 out of 12 fives. Well, remember though, this is binomial, right? It's a binomial experiment. So we actually know exactly how to get those probabilities. Let me go grab section 6.2. Here we go. In section 6.2, we learned how to find binomial probabilities. And the probability of exactly 12, that's what we're looking for, is binome PDF n comma p comma x. n for us was 12 because we rolled 12 times. p was assumed to be 1 6 right? Because there's one side out of six that is um, a five. And then x is 12. Okay, so let me do this. So I want to find binome pdf 12 comma 1 sixth comma 12. And there we have that. So let me grab the calculator. It's been a while. It's in the distribution menu. Remember, that's where all the probability distributions are. And binome pdf is actually letter A. Let me grab that. I had 12 trials, I have a 1 out of 6 chance, and I want the probability of exactly 12 because that's what Steve got. All right, that's scientific notation. Don't lose the E over here. That's times 10 to the negative 10. So that means I have to move the decimal point 10 spots to the left. Yes, it's that small. So let me type that up. So it's 1. Right? extremely small very 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 small I think it was four five nine was the next numbers and I'm just gonna put in some commas here just to give you guys scale so you have a sense of it normally commas are not used in the low numbers but just so you guys can see there's nine zeros here and then that one there and that four five nine that is very 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 low okay so because that probability is very 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 low it's more likely that there's something going on than just being a fluke. When you do the p-value method, what you're kind of doing is discounting this one. So you find the chances of it being a fluke, and then you go, wait a second, that is so low. It's literally larger than your chance of being struck by lightning. I know it at least once, but possibly twice. It's very, very, very low. So you kind of go, okay, well, that's the probability of the random chance. I don't think it's that. I think something's up with this die, right? So you can either prove something's up with his die by saying there's this huge gap between him and the rest of the group, right? That's the classical method. And then the p-value method is the probability of getting what he's got is so low that I think it's more likely that something else is going on instead. Those are the two broad stoke methods we're going to use. Um, the, p the classical method's kind of the older method. Um, you find somebody's z-score and you kind of show that's far away from the rest of the group, right? This is so unusually high a z-score, I call BS and say that there's something going on with his die. And then the other method is finding the chances of it being a random fluke, right? That's what this is. This is the probability of a fluke. Let me write it out. The probability of fluke, right? That random chance. So the probability of getting what he got just by random chance. And if it's really, 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 really low, you're going to say, no, I don't think that's going on either. Now, notice which one we don't talk about. We don't actually ever really deal with the, the lying sample bias thing, and that's because you can't. I mean, there's nothing you can do with something that's random and unbiased, or something that's not random, excuse me, and unbiased. So we just kind of ignore that one. So the p-value method's sort of dealing with, let me highlight these, the p-value method's sort of dealing with the probability of a fluke right here, right? And then the classical method 
is sort of dealing um, with the same thing, but in a different way, right? It's there's a huge gap between Steve and the rest of the group, both of which are proving that you think there's something up. So both of them are proving this yellow bit right here. So I'm changing my coloring a little bit to make this clear. So sample bias, we don't do much with it. I just made it gray because, you know, there's nothing you can do with it. So we just kind of ignore that, even though real life, of course, it can happen. The probability of the fluke part is kind of being shown by the p-value. That's why the p-value is so nice. I like the p-value method a lot. The classical method's sort of old school. It's also proving the green one, but in kind of a backwards way. Both of these methods are trying to prove yellow. That's why I shouldn't have colored the classical method yellow they're both proving that yellow thing. It's just they're proving it in different ways. One of them proves it by finding the probability of the fluke. One of them proves it by kind of making a logic argument. You're so far away from the rest that I think something's up.